So last time we talked about creating gameplay abilities and we made this very simple like dash and attack ability, which ended up taking quite a while. This doesn't even deal damage as a result of that. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is we want to be dealing damage. Now, we have this entire setup here, which uh, applies root motion, it plays a dashing animation, if we have one, we don't, and it plays the attacking animation and then it ends the ability when the animation is complete. But after it starts playing the animation, and before the animation ends, we want to check whether or not our weapon is overlapping with an enemy. And if it is, we want to damage that enemy. So what we'll do with that is we can wait for a gameplay event which we'll do immediately after we start playing our animation montage. Here we can say a simple tag that we want to be waiting for. So we can say, um, make a new tag, and I want to make a tag called event.damage. You don't necessarily need to call it event.damage, you can just call it damage or player.damage. You can call this whatever you want. I like to make a specific parent tag for all my events to just keep things organized. So we can add that new tag there and that we have as the tag that we'll be waiting for, event.damage. We can set this to only trigger once and if we do that during this gameplay ability we'll only be able to damage things one single time. So if you have a sword slash that might overlap with an enemy then not overlap and then overlap again that would deal damage twice. This is a quick and dirty way of preventing that, but do be aware that that also means that you can not damage multiple enemies with one strike, because as soon as you've done this event one time, it's not going to allow doing it again until you do the entire ability again as well. We might get into some more deeper stuff about how to keep track of the enemies that you've hit and checking whether or not we want to like send gameplay events because of that. That's a little beyond what we're doing right here, right now. So we're going to just uh, set this to trigger once and ignore everything else. Then when this event is received, we get a payload with it. And I'll show you in a moment what that payload is and how we can set it up and everything like that. Uh, but for now, let's just break the gameplay event data to get all of the information out of it. So we've got the event tag, which will be event.damage in our case. Uh, but we also got the instigator, which is the character that sent the gameplay event through. We've got the target, which is the thing that we're targeting, which in this case will be our enemy. Then we've got the optional object one and two, and these are just here for you to send through information that isn't usually contained within this struct uh, because we've got like instigator tags and contacts handle and all these other things but you might want to send through something else as well like the armor color of whatever actor you're hitting and you can put that in a specific object and you can pass through that object then in here we want to cast to that type of object and then we can get that information back out again Honestly, I don't really use these optional objects uh, all that much, but it is nice that we can send through pretty much arbitrary data in whatever way we want through these optional objects. So we're going to uh, get the target gameplay ability system component, get ability system component, and to that we're going to apply effect to target. So the target will be that gameplay um, ability system component, and then the thing that will be doing the execution of it, it's kind of annoying that it has two pins called target because usually uh, a node has pins called target for the thing that is executing that code. But this also has an actual target. So the top target is the thing that will be executing the gameplay effect and the bottom pin here will be the thing that is receiving that gameplay event. Uh, so we'll be using the instigator which in all cases really should just be the same thing as our avatar actor here so as a matter of fact you could very much just use this as well the ability system component on that if you wanted to that would work entirely fine and we'll apply that gameplay effect uh, on event received and the gameplay effect that we'll be applying will be like a damaging one so that's just very similar to what we've made before here. Gameplay effect use mana. We'll just copy that over uh, and we'll say gameplay effect deal damage. And for now, we'll just change the uh, attribute set dot mana to basic attribute set dot health. 
We'll get back into this in a moment, uh, because at the moment this will just always deal 20 health damage, uh, which is less than great. <laughs> we can use this uh, set by color, and that will allow us to set this custom based on each use of it, which is very, very neat. Uh, but that's something that we'll get into in a moment. Maybe in the next video, depending on how long I take in this video. So now our gameplay effect is set up to deal damage to whatever we're hitting. But we need to send that event from our character to our gameplay ability. And this is where things get a little bit more tricky. So if we open up our character blueprint here, we will want to add some collision boxes to these weapons first and foremost. So we'll do that. We'll add a box collision and we'll add that to a parent socket. And we open up our skeleton mesh here to find out what socket we want to parent this to. So the sockets are called weapon underscore L and presumably there's also a underscore R for that. Coming back, making sure we have our box collision selected here. What we wanna do is we wanna select this and we'll just type weapon underscore L and that sets that to be parented to the weapon socket or bone and from there we can fairly easily just make the box extend whatever we want it to be and we can drag it over to roughly be over the blade of our weapon it's okay if the box is a fair bit bigger than the actual blade itself because in general we want to have a situation where we give the player the benefit of the doubt like if it just didn't connect we want the player to feel like oh that connected that's really really good rather than it being a little bit too small and the player like oh but that definitely connected and we don't actually do any damage that would be very very annoying so then we copy over that box again and this time we're going to parent it to weapon underscore r where we will pull this up a little bit more toward this blade instead you probably want to pause the animation uh for this by the way if you're doing this uh which you can do by selecting the mesh and then going into animation advanced and we can pause animations that will pause the animations in the viewport and allow you to drag these boxes around a little bit more easily once the boxes are in place what we can do is we can just deselect pause animations and now we've got damage boxes on our weapons which by default should not be doing anything. So generally overlap events should be off on both of those. And there's a bunch of ways to enable and disable these during the animation. Uh, you can make a whole function in a animation notify state, which is the most optimal way to do things. Uh, but for the time being, what we're simply going to do is we're just going to make two animation notifies here. Uh, so we'll just do a right click, uh, maybe even a little earlier, like right here. We say uh, animation notify, we'll make a new notify, and that is turn on, uh, I think this is the right axe. And it swings through all the way down there, and we'll make another notify here, and that will be the turn off right. And we don't really need to worry about the left axe because we're not using that at the moment. Uh, just for ease of use, I'm going to uh, call these right box and left box so I can actually easily keep track of which one is. So this way we fire an event at this point to turn it on and at this point to turn it off. And those events will now be accessible through our animation blueprint for this guy um, in the event graph. So we can simply say... Um, like if we type in axe, we can see the turn off axe and turn on right axe here. And we'll use the try get pawn owner node uh, and just so simply cast that to whatever the hell this is called again, um, camera player character. From there, we'll get the right box and set generate overlap events to being false when we turn it off and we can copy this entire thing over. And we'll set generate overlap events to being true when we turn on the X. Again, you can make this a little bit more optimal by programming a animation uh, notify state, which pretty much just does this, uh, but it allows you to easily move these things around in your animation timeline. Do look into that if you're interested in it. Uh, for now, though, I'm going to just do it this sloppy and easy way. Uh, back in our character blueprint, uh, we'll go into the event graph now. 
we'll select the damage boxes and say overlap and we can just use the event overlap if we wanted to but we can also use the component overlaps if we have multiple damage boxes that can overlap uh, for whatever reason or if you want to have different effects for the left and the right one uh, for the time being, what we're going to do is we're just simply going to use the uh, actor begin overlap. The only two things that actually can overlap anything are the damages, so we'll be fine. Uh, but do note that you can do this on each individual damage box. And here, finally, we'll simply send a gameplay event to actor. So we'll be sending this to ourselves. So we can just set uh, get reference to self as the actor that we'll be sending it to. The event tag will be matching with the event tag that we put in our gameplay ability. So that will be event damage. So we'll just check we want to get uh, event.damage for the tag. And then the payload, uh, we will make gameplay event data. Uh, we can set the event tag to event.damage as well. It's not entirely necessary to do that, but it's good to just have that information uh, properly in there then the instigator will be uh, ourselves as well and the target will be the other actor and here you can see we can put in other optional objects which have any arbitrary data in them whatsoever and again we can then access that arbitrary data that we've sent through with this event in our gameplay ability and we will have to cast to whatever type of object that we put in there and this is quite simply as easy as it is so now uh what we'll do just to show this off uh, a little bit easier is i'm going to uh open up this guy's blueprint as well and i'll add in a tech event where i just simply uh get the ability system component for this guy which have i even gotten him any attributes at all i don't think i have <laughs> So we'll give him the starting attributes for the basic one and then the default uh, data table. Did I even populate this with any information? Seems like I did. That's very good. And we'll just get his uh, health value uh, every tick and just print that out just to show you that we're actually damaging him. So we'll print string uh, and say return value uh, print that out. And then the final step is to add in the gameplay effects that we made uh, which deals damage. It's very important obviously. And now that we have all that, we should be able to deal some damage to him. And you see, he goes from 100 to 80. And then when we do it again, he goes to 60. And we effectively have a combat system now. It kind of sucks because our attack is really, really clunky. Uh, and it's kind of hard to hit. But the basics of a combat system are in here now. And a very big thank you to all of my patrons. You can see them on screen right now. If you want to help out supporting the channel, there's a link down below in the description to the Patreon page. And a special thanks to my Cave Digger tier patrons, Sergey Thomas, 